Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2017 in Orlando, Florida, the 10 year anniversary of this event. Our next speaker, it's actually a second presentation at our event. His first one was yesterday for the first time ever. It was also his first public outing as a speaker and an author. Without further ado, please help me welcome the internet's new number one supervillain, Rolo Tomasi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That'll, that'll work, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll sit here. Let's go over. Oh, you can sit there. That's fine. You got those right there. Uh, I just wanted to, before I get started here, um, I, everybody has probably already seen my uh, my hypergamy uh, talk from yesterday. Can uh, I real quick? Am, am I on? Okay. <laughs> um, and I kind of wanted to structure this talk a little bit differently now. Um, it's occurred to me um, that I do really well one-on-one -on -one with everybody. I, I, when I do an interview, um, it's, it's really something that I kind of get real nervous in when I'm first starting out and then I kind of hit my stride, but I'm always really on top of my game, I think, when people are asking me questions. And so for this particular um, topic we're going to talk about today, which is positive masculinity, which is also the title of my most recent book, uh, I just wanted to have sort of a one-on-one -on -one with Anthony here because it's just, it's occurred to me that, you know, when people are coming up to me here at the, at the convention, uh, they all have pretty much the same story. I mean, if you've met me, if you shake my hand, um, the first question I'm going to ask you is, how did you come to find the red pill? How did you hear about my, my book? How did you hear about my work? Um, I, I think I had one guy over here saying that his therapist actually gave him the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the book, which floored me because that's the first time I've ever heard something like that, that is someone in a professional psychological field is actually using a, the first, at least the first book as a basis for uh, helping another guy. And so really that's what my work is about. It's about helping you guys and putting it out there. Um, as I've said many occasions, I don't do this for a living. I, I have other irons in the fire when it comes to uh, you know, making my own revenue and, and, and doing, you know, what it is that I do on my day-to-day -day basis. But I've always felt that uh, helping guys out and, and articulating the things that they can't particularly uh, come up with themselves, or maybe it's just on the tip of their tongue, or they've always knew, known this stuff, but they haven't been able to really put it into words. And these are just some of the, uh, the things that I get uh, I get asked, uh, you know, how did you come up with this stuff and how did you uh, come to, you know, a lot of the core principles like uh, there is no one or hypergamy or, um, uh, you know, hypergamy doesn't care or those, those kind of seminal posts that ended up in, in the book or the, most of the books. Um, so I want to say right now, like I, I'm a really good aggregate. Uh, or you know of information like I say in the in the intros of all my books I, I, I connect dots but it's you guys that give me the dots to connect in the first place uh, most of the work that I did on the very first book came from when I was a moderator at so suave and so if you're not unfamiliar with so suave it was a pickup artist kind of game community forum for a very long time it's been around since it's actually been through two iterations. The, the most recent one actually was in 2002. And then right around 2000, it was under a, a different proprietor and then it changed hands. And it's been going since 2002 and it's still there today. It's what I call a hot kitchen. It's, it's a lot of back and forth and it's a lot of guys sometimes fighting. And sometimes you have to sort of put up with um, people trolling and people fighting each other to really get to the meat of the matter. And I really think that from my perspective, uh, I'm the kind of guy that needs to have one-on-one -on -one with people. I, I'm, I'm like, like I said, I'm an aggregate. So um, when I was a moderator at the SoSwap Forum, people kept saying, you need to do a blog, you need to do a blog. And then, of course, once I did a blog, they said, you need to write a book. Um, but I've never been like that. I've always wanted to have you know, guys come together and have this discussion. And that's why I just want to say that's why I really appreciate this convention, because we're all coming together and we're all comparing notes. And, if, I, if there is a definition of the manosphere, it is that we are a consortium of guys coming together to share our experiences. And it doesn't matter where, where you're from or, or your ethnicity or your cultural background or how much money you make or whatever. It's guys coming together and sharing that because I really believe that each one of us has something to share and something to learn from everybody else here. 
And, you know, I don't, don't want to get all new agey and feel goody and all that stuff. You know, we're not going to sit around a campfire and do that. We're, you know, I mean, we're fucking men, you know, <laughs> just by watching a hunter just before this. It's like the guy has such a passion. He has such a, uh, a drive. Uh, that, that motivates him. There's just something inside of him that said, you know, I got to do this. And, you know, he's never come up and, and spoke in front of people before. And, you know, I just knew the guy had a really good message and I knew he needed to get it out there. Uh, if you've seen any of his Periscope videos, it's just, you, you, there's a fire in the guy. And he's not a pickup artist. He's not uh, that side when people associate the red pill with being, um, being a pickup artist or being, you know, the red pill is just about fucking chicks. It's just about fucking chicks. I'm, I'm here to tell you that it's not just about fucking chicks. It's a lot more than that. There's more to the awareness, to what I always call red pill awareness, and there's different avenues for that, and there's different ways for a man to express that. Um, one of those ways, I really think, is in our redefining what masculinity is today. And that's why I titled the third book Positive Masculinity, uh, again, coming from angles that you wouldn't necessarily associate with the red pill. You wouldn't always say, well, uh, the red pill is for fathers, or the red pill is for husbands, or the red pill is for, you know, the red pill awareness is for any of those guys, because we always want to say that, like I said, it's all, all about pickup artists. It's all about uh, those, those angry guys on the, on the TRP form. And it's not. It's so much more than that. And I think that when I was helping Anthony out with, with finding some of the speakers for this, it, what we have here today is just such a, a breadth of, of different niches and different stories all coming together to sort of redefine what it is to be a guy in 2017. So what I've done here is I, for, this, for this particular talk, um, if you guys have a question, just shoot it out at me. And if you have something, even a, you don't even have a question, if you have a comment, raise your hand and make that comment as to what, you know, if you think it's pertinent to the, to the conversation. Just we'll repeat it into the mic. That's yeah. fine. That's, that's fine. However you guys want to do that. Um, now, so I brought Anthony up on here. Oh, go. Right. And uh, it's, it's a whole different experience. Yeah, it is. When you were talking to somebody face to face. Yeah. So his comment was about feeling isolated before the event. And here at this event, it's men getting together and doing. There's a lot of talking too going on, mm -hmm. but it's men doing. It's a physical, it's a very physical live event. Yeah. Excuse me. Well, I'll also tell you this. I've, I've met most of you over the course of just the last couple of days, whether it was the, you know, the early meet and greet or last night or anywhere else. It's, I can't even get back to my hotel room because I've got so many guys coming up to me saying, you know, thank you. You really saved my life. You really, your work has, has been great. And it's getting to the point right now where I might not have ever you know, met you in my entire life, but I'm going to be talking to you like I know you personally because I do know you personally. I know you from, from reading my book and what your, your backgrounds are, whether you've participated on Twitter or you've, you've commented on my blog. I feel like I know each and every one of you. So don't feel like a stranger when you come up to me. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to you know, talk with you. Rola, I didn't tell you this, but when I meet your wife at some point, the yeah. first question I was going to ask her is, how's it feel to be married to a rock star? Yeah. Just based oh, that, on, just based was on that going to be your introduction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because I've seen you walking around and a lot of speakers are the well, same way. Well, you know, it's you funny. It's just, it's, I've kind of, you know, a lot of people think that if you haven't made it big by the time you're 30 or you've had made, you haven't made your, your impression on the world by the time you're 40, um, things aren't really going to happen for you. I'll t I'm be the first one to tell you that that's bullshit. Um, guys in their 50s can get out there and, and kill it and still make an impact. Um, a lot of people already know my own personal background was I used to be a, a rock star in a sense, in a, in a semi-professional sense down in Hollywood, uh, California in the, uh, in the, early, or the early 90s, late 80s. And, you know, it was always something I struggled with. And it was all, you know, a lot of the principles that I learned about game, I didn't know it was game at that time. I was just going through the motions and doing what, uh, you know, deductive reasoning, you know, uh, trial and error kind of, you know, working with girls. And it was really easy for me because I had blonde hair down to my ass. And it's hard to believe now. But, um, but my whole game back then was uh, social proof and pre-selection. It was very easy to do that in that particular era. And then, you know, things change, music styles change, uh, society changes. And, 
you know, I, I, there, was a, there was a point where I'm like, you know, I'm just getting to, to be about my late 20s or early 30s. And I'm like, well, I haven't, I'm not a rock star now, so. You are uh, now. Yeah, and so there's, I think that's, um, I think one of, uh, was it Ryan Stone was saying, um, you know, it's, not, it's never too late. It's never too late to make an impact. It's never too late to make a dent in the universe, as, as Steve Jobs would say. Well, look at Andrew the Private Man. He's yes, a perfect example exactly, there. exactly. So I'm going to have a little discourse here with Anthony, and we're going to do a few, a little bit of Q&A that's going to lead me into uh, what I call positive masculinity. And I think that that's kind of a loaded term. I was really reluctant to call um, the third book positive masculinity because people will then associate it as being, well, there must be a negative masculinity. There must be uh, you know, toxic masculinity. There must be hyper masculinity. So we're gonna add all these little prefixes onto masculinity. Uh, so I was a little, I was a little remiss to, to, to do that, but uh, I really think that masculinity today is uh, something that we've been conditioned as men to really uh, think is there's a blurred line or we want to we want to define it for ourselves or we're expected to have um, you know have a definition all to our own that we you know, that we define on our own but all of that is based on what our blue pill conditioning was prior to us coming to that conclusion. So I'm just gonna do a little back and forth here with Anthony, and then if you have a comment or if you have a question, you know, feel free to, to raise, raise a hand. So. Let's, do it. Let's do it. So the first question, real simple right off the bat, mm -hmm. why did you write Positive Masculinity, the third book? Okay, the reason I did was, um, like I was just saying a minute ago, I really think that masculinity itself is being uh, obfuscated, it's being blurred, it's being distorted. Um, by what I call in the book called the village. Has anybody ever heard the term, uh, it takes a village to raise a child, right? Okay, so I use that kind of as a catch-all phrase, and I've, I use a lot of these in my writing, uh, like the feminine imperative, and in, in positive masculinity, um, I use that term, the village, to represent like, uh, not just the, the, the teachers that are teaching you when you are a little kid, and we're talking about like, from five years on up, because five years old is about the most impressionable uh, that a kid is going to be, and they're gonna learn a lot of their core beliefs and their core sets right at, um, at that age. And because anybody ever hear that, like kids who are five years old, they, they're like mental sponges. So I think that earlier and earlier, the village is trying to get to kids to convince them that uh, being a boy is bad. It's what I call uh, gender loathing. That being a being a little boy is like a, uh, uh, like a defective girl, basically. Exactly. They're teaching teaching boys that it is correct and it's better to be a girl. It's uh, they're, they're teaching styles. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Camille Paglia. She has she was a, a former feminist, but she writes quite a bit about the education of young children and boys um, being raised as defective girls, and the teaching style, which of course is mostly women teaching, teaching your kids that are you know, yay big, um, is instilling them and putting this, these blue pill beliefs into them at an earlier and earlier age. So they already feel in some way slighted because they're a boy. Um, if the boy is acting out, if he acts like a boy, if he has a lot of energy and he wants to go out in the, on the playground, what we do? We sedate the kid, right? So, from a very early age, that boy is being taught that being a boy, being male, is a bad thing. In my, I think it was my second book, uh, there is a, uh, actually came from a post called Teach Your Children Well. And on that post, I took a picture, or I, I, I screen capped a picture of uh, a blackboard or a, a, a video display. And what the teachers had done for this class of nine-year-old boys was ask them what it is about being a boy that they dislike the most. And if you looked at the list of adjectives, and it's, like I said, it's in the second book, it will run down pretty much what you would expect from a women's studies class about what is the most wrong things about men today. And so we're talking about teaching what, fourth graders, nine years old, about fourth grade, fifth grade, somewhere around there. Yeah. You're talking about reaching the youngest of the young to pre-program, precondition for the blue pill, um, these kids. And so as far as positive masculinity is, you know, titling it as, as that, um, I think my, my push is to change guys' minds about what it is to be masculine. I was just reading a, um, 
reading a, uh, an article the other day about how um, guys simply don't want to be masculine. They don't want to have to figure it out anymore. It's gone from defining it for yourself in a feminine correct terminology to just completely saying, oh, fuck that masculinity stuff. I'm just going to be whoever I'm going to be and then expect you know, women to appreciate that, expect women to say, oh, uh, he's a non-masculine guy, so he's identifying with the feminine, so therefore um, he's unique or he's not like other guys. I'm here to tell you right now, he is like every other guy that there is because we, outside of this room, out here in the streets right now, we are the minority. Um, for us to all collect here together, and if we were to have you know, media here or people who are outside, the, the first thing they would say is, these guys are losers. Or these guys are, they, they need to find out about women, they need to find out how to date, they need to find out uh, how to be a man, what losers? Because we're all supposed to have some intrinsic knowledge of what it is to be a guy. And I'll tell you right now, when you're five years old and your teacher is telling you that it's better to be a girl, and then you get to be 10 years old, and then you get to be 15, and you get to be 20 years old, all of that builds up layer upon layer upon layer to the point where you don't know what masculinity is. So that's really why I, I titled it that, because it's really an effort to, to counteract what I call the village. I had a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Do I need to no, I got no, it. Okay. I'll repeat it. My question is, I had read recently that the, uh, the vast majority of transgender people are men wanting to become women right. versus women. Right. Wanting to become women. Mm -hmm. You think that's a direct result of the feminine? Exactly. Feminine? Yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about that. So the question or the statement was about transgenderism and that happening. It's being almost a ninety something percent male to female, mm -hmm. yes. not the other way around. There's yeah. some Red Queen uh, indication of this too. I've seen you tweet about it. Right. Right. Um, what you're referring to is I have a. Uh, it's it, I, I believe I put it in the third book. It's called um, transitioning, and that post and that essay was a direct response to an article about how. Um, little boys as young as four years old were being conditioned to believe that they, or, well, that they were being conditioned to believe, but everyone else is trying to be convinced that a, a child of four years old is so familiar with, with gender concepts and what it is like to be a boy and a girl um, that they can make their own choice as to whether they want to identify as a boy or identify as a girl. And I really find this kind of ironic because um, well, at that age, too, we don't even trust a four-year-old to walk down the street on their own. Right. But we, then you can choose your own gender. Exactly. It's insane. We have, a, we have an age of consent that, at least in this country, is right around, what, 17 or 18 right now? I, I don't forget. Depends what the on actual, the state. Depends on the state. Could be as young as So let's say no younger than 16. So that, that kid at 16 years old, we deem as a society, cannot make that choice for itself. We say you cannot, you, you will be taken, uh, taken advantage of by an adult who is, uh, who is trying to basically statutory rape, uh, to rape you. So we're going to say that a 16-year-old doesn't know enough about sexuality, enough about its own, uh, you know, to make proper choices that they cannot consent to sex. Um, we won't let a kid uh, drive a car until they're 16. Uh, we won't let you drink alcohol. You can't even vote until you're 18 because you don't, we, we as a society deem that you don't know enough about the political process or won't make wise decisions until you're 18 years old. We don't think you'll make good choices about drinking alcohol until you're 21 years old. But we're going to say that a four-year-old kid knows enough about its own, instinctually knows enough about its, its gender and enough about what's going on gender-wise in our society. I mean, shit, we've got, what, 65 different genders that, you know, that we're supposed to accept as being I'd normal I'd be surprised right if now. it was that low at this point. Yeah. And so it's, it's, just, it's just amazing to me that, that we will try to convince the, an entirety of the society that it's okay for that, but yet we don't want to have the age of consent be any lower than 16. And I'll tell you right now, the trans, convincing you know, the, the vast majority of people to say that you know, a child of four can, can do that, I will say that the next step for that is probably lowering the age of consent because if a kid can make those kind of sexual choices at four years old, then why not 10 years old? And what why you're talking about specifically too is like medical doctors actually giving authorization for hormones yes, pumped into these yes, kids. To, block, like to do blo hormone blocking. To stop puberty yeah. from happening in the first exactly. place. Exactly. Right? And again, what you were just talking about, um, a, the vast, I don't even, I'm don't even. i not going to say statistics here because I, I don't know them exactly, I don't have them written down, but I know that the vast majority of transgender children are boys to girls because, again, in the Red Queen, uh, there are certain, and it's not just human beings, but in animal populations, if it is more advantageous to be one sex or the other, 
that population will end up shifting over to prefer one sex above the other. And I really think that since the sexual revolution, that's, that's kind of the direction we've taken um, to prefer and elevate the feminine, uh, just womankind. Uh, we talk about, you know, pedestalizing women. I'm talking about pedestalizing womankind altogether. Um, and I, I really think To the think level of getting your dick chopped off. Yeah, or, 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 or uh, you know, mu it's, it's, it's mutilation is what it is. Yeah. It's mutilating yourself. I got one back here. Go ahead. Yeah, that's probably because, true. Because it's in such a female driven profession uh, that in actual fact males are discouraged to uh, participate and during primary starts at five years, mm -hmm. right? When the kids are most impressionable. Most impressionable, yes. So how do you then uh, address that when the system is so massively against you? And Australia, like the US, is yep. quite a egalitarian, feminine. Right. It's, a, it's probably even a bit more. Yeah, it's probably a bit more, yeah. even, I would say. Oh, so we got to repeat yeah. this, okay. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the statement uh, was about uh, basically the effect of feminism and the feminine imperative in Australia, and it's affecting the school systems, and male teachers even enter entering into... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's about uh, male teachers being disin disincentivized and, dis and told to avoid becoming even a teacher. Mm -hmm. They're discouraged. Well, yes. yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, that is a symptom of a much larger problem right now. And what that problem is, is that we don't trust men with children anymore. Uh, there was about, yeah, about, about four years, maybe five years ago, I, I came across a story of this doctor. I think he was a surgeon of some sorts. And it was in Arizona. And uh, the guy was in Borders or one of these bookstores like Barnes and Noble or something and he would walk in, he'd walked into the children's section of the children's literature. He was by himself, walked into there and was going through the books to look for uh, a suitable reading book for his, you know, very young uh, nephew, I believe it was. So he's walking through there and one of the employees comes up to him and, and says, excuse me, sir, um, can you leave the child, the children's book section right now? Uh, because, and he's like, well, well, why? You know, like I'm just looking for a book or whatever. Well, apparently, some of the people within the bookstore were saying that that guy's a pedophile or that guy's a creeper, and he is, uh, he's scaring the kids, or, or we don't, we, he has a look to him that makes it look as if he is a pedophile of some sort. And that means probably a more masculine look, so a, yeah. a beard. And so, yeah, a beard or something, and then so, and he did have a beard. Yeah, and so, what did they do? Is they took the guy and they ejected him from. From the from the store, and he just he went out, and they 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 kicked him out um, after he said, "Hey, I'm not a pedophile. I'm just looking for a book for my, for my nephew." Yeah, exactly. I'm shopping. It ended up becoming a, a local news story, and he took uh, I think it was Barnes and Noble to court, and they settled out of court for I, I forget what it was, probably about a hundred thousand dollars or something. Good. But the thing is, is that is another symptom of the idea that is endemic, I think, in our society right now, where we don't trust men with children. And I think the latent purpose behind that is that we want to have that separation of what, would be, what I consider conventional masculinity or traditional masculinity and keep them away from the kids and to try to get as much of the feminine imperative as we possibly can into the next generation of kids. And that's what we're talking about here for younger and younger they have to keep pushing younger and younger because they need to get it earlier and earlier into the next generation of kids coming out. So it's not enough anymore to just get these guys, get these boys in the grade school anymore or even uh, like junior high school. We have to go and get them when they're four years old, when their brains aren't even developed. They have no capacity for abstract thought. We got to get them and we got to, in, you know, inculcate this you know, ideology of this blue pill ideology in these kids as early in an age as we possibly can. What it sounds like to me is that even more broadly, masculinity is so, the culture is so hostile to even any semblance of masculinity, it's becoming criminal sort of to even shop. Like this guy was oh, just yeah. trying to buy a book. Right. Just walking out of a bookstore trying to buy, and 
So yeah, it's like you mentioned too yeah. on uh, in France right now. They're trying to make it illegal to even hit on a woman. Right. Yeah. Phone they'll, make it a, they'll make it a hate crime for uh, Goldman yeah. to go and talk to somebody. On the just just basic <laughs> normal human interaction, yeah. right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You see it in every aspect of advertising. Yep. You know, that you is. see it in the movies. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're usurping all of our male role models. Right. You know, you listen to Jordan Peterson talk about, you know, the archetypical hero and mm-hmm. how that developed. Right. And they're taking that away. Right. You know, I'm glad you uh, you want to repeat this. that. Yeah, go ahead and restate so that real quick. The basic statement is that uh, what we're talking about is the basic fundamental premise. It's really simple. Men bad, women good. Right. We're evil, they're angels. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's nonsense. And, and let's talk about Jordan Peterson. Well, he also mentioned the, the concept of archetypes, where there's a masculine archetype that um, is like the heroic male. Um, we don't see that anymore. Um, as I was saying right before we came on here, I'm sure everybody knows by the time you're watching this that, um, that Hugh Hefner has died. And if you want to give it up for Hugh Hefner, go ahead. <laughs> uh, now, I'm glad you guys can appreciate that because the, the feminist press or the feminine imperative press right now is just eviscerating uh, Hugh Hefner as being this archetypical uh, relic of this old masculinity who uh, you know, went out and actually, I mean, I've, I got a lot of respect for Hugh Hefner. The guy went and, and did something that nobody had ever done before in a society that was, was very much against him posting, you know, eroticized pictures of women in, you know, in a magazine. That was really his claim. That was his dent in the universe is, is Playboy magazine. Now, you can say what you want to about what's happened to that magazine in the, in the interim. You can talk about how Hugh Hefner's lifestyle was, you know, good or bad, however you want to talk about that. But you cannot take away from the guy that he did that from the perspective of a, of a male archetype that no longer exists right now. Uh, I think that since the sexual revolution has come around, um, that heroic male archetype, the one where we're, we're positively looking up to them, it's the, a father is no longer up here anymore. A father is ridiculous. A father is, uh, you know, um, Dr. Huxtable. A, a father is Homer Simpson. A father is, you know. Uh, well, in a way, he's both. He's, uh, if he's gone, then he's necessary. But if he's there, right. he's, he's completely necessary. He's yeah, and that's, I, I, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit here. Yeah. But like when we were talking, I was, one of the reasons I wanted to have um, uh, Ryan and, and Hunter here is because it's a, a, an example of positive masculinity in a fathership role. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, oh, every father is superfluous. And I, in my book, if you've read the third book, I make a case for this conflict or this contradiction in, in the mainstream where we will say a woman is strong and independent and she's, she's a hero if she's a single mother and she takes care of her kids and she's also, not only is she a good mother, she's also taking over the role of the father because of those horrible deadbeat guys who just won't man up and they won't take you know, control or they won't, uh, they won't take responsibility for being a father. And so we hear about deadbeat dads and we hear about um, just how horrible they are and then you know, we'll, we'll praise the woman, we'll praise her up as being, you know, a single mom is, is just it, the highest praise that we can give them. And well, it's treason to consider that her responsibility was, she had sex with that guy. Right, well, we, we, we excuse, once she's become a mother, she's no longer that girl that went and, you know, had sex with the she's alpha. An, she's that, clearly an angel. That him. Yeah. So. Well, so we have that contradiction right there. So we think that men are completely not useful. And then we have the other contradiction, which is, Men are vitally, vitally necessary in the home, and they're vitally, vitally necessary to the upbringing of a child, but not so much. They're just there to take the rap if we go and we see, peop- we see kids riding in the streets or we see uh, youth crime. We're happy to go and we're happy to blame that on the lack of a man in the family, but then in the, the next breath, we're gonna say, oh, but we don't need no man. We don't need a man in the family. We don't need a, a, a father because a woman knows enough about you know, being a man herself because she has to do it all. But I thought it was all about equality. That. Well, what happened we, to that? We, we, can, we can say that for another talk when we get into egalitarian equalism. Yeah, well, you talk about um, the end state or the end goal of the feminine imperative is unlimited hypergamy for women. Um, and Unlimited, is, yeah. Do you think that 
the end state or the, 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 the there's an insidious objective. The, the whole reason this train of marginalizing the masculine was put into place or had, had left the station was to, uh, as a control system, uh, say politically to mm -hmm. prevent uprising or do you think that's why they're masculine? I've he I have heard that We need before. to restate this. Okay, go ahead. You got it? No, no you, I'll, I got it. Yeah. He, you're basically saying that um, that there is a political, socio-political, socio-economic um, reasoning, you know, behind the, at play behind the scenes, uh, you know, fomenting uh, feminism. And and I would say that, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen the videos of uh, the Rockefeller saying, if we can just get more women into the the uh, into the workplace, uh, we can, you know reduce the risk for having uprisings. We can reduce the risk for, um, you know, upsets in the, in the system. I've seen those before, and I think there is some merit to that. The only thing I would say is that the only reason that the Rockefellers would have come to that conclusion um, is that they already knew that the, the intersexual dynamic, they already knew that the, the, the key to uh, keeping men down was to empower their women. So if, if we're going to take men down and make them less dangerous and make them less powerful, the easiest way to do that is to hit them at their Achilles heel, which is what? Which is sex. So, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely something, something to that. Well, he also mentioned an end game, and I've heard you say this on Twitter even recently. Mm -hmm. You call it an extermination agenda. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little well, bit? an extinction agenda is what I yeah. called it. Um, yes, I, I really think, and we'll, we'll get to this here in a moment, I really think that uh, masculinity and anything male is being removed from society right now. And I've got a post called uh, Remove the Male. And, or remove the man. And that is sort of symbolic in so many different ways. Uh, what, what led me to that post was, uh, I believe it is a, a university in Washington and some even government uh, bylaws uh, for some state governments where the, there was an initiative where they put in you know, millions of dollars to remove the, and th these letters, M-A-N, from all the bylaws, from all of the, you know, the, the college literature. So if it was fireman, it was fire person. Um, it was, if it was penmanship, it was, you know, handwriting or something. I think it this was, is even in the out. statutes and so the laws in that state. It wasn't right. just like a college or something. Yeah, and, they, like, and I'll tell you the other thing is that they felt so strongly about it, it was a six year long initiative for them to go through all the, the, entire, the entirety of their bylaws and any of their written literature and make it gender neutral. And they did it all using taxpayer money. Right. And I, I think that it's important to also make the distinction that it's not about making something gender neutral. It's about removing men from the equation. Uh, it's one thing to go and say, uh, we're going to make things more equal, but to make things more equal, we have to remove men from that from that entire process. So the equality thing is kind of like a smoke screen. It's the excuse. Yes, yeah, it's to get you to, it's to get you to the next point. Like we were talking about um, the, the the transgender kids who are being taught that it's bad to be a boy. Well, what's the next point from that? Well, where does that kid go? He ends up becoming just recently I've seen they're encouraging this kid to be a professional drag queen at like 9 or 10 years old. And we're going to be completely appalled by little girls, you know, twerking on stage and doing these, you know, sexy stripper dances. We're going to be appalled by that. But we sexualize a boy to, you know, be like RuPaul, and we sexualize that kid. That's okay because that's like gender bending and that's that's breaking through a, a barrier of some sorts. But we're doing exactly the same thing to that boy, and that's okay. And I see that as part of the remove the man kind of agenda. This also goes to. Um, into divorce laws, into um, legislation about consent, whereas if, like, when you're talking about uh, the yes means yes, it's always, can I touch you here? Can I touch you here? Can I do this? And it's never the woman who is, you know, the onus is not on her to ask you permission. It's always the guy. And it's always presumed that the guy is the one who is the sexual aggressor in that. So we have consent laws that eliminate the man's influence in that particular situation. Over here. Oh. Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Um, so I, the, this red pill stuff is sort of new to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the facts you talk about, hypergamy and uh, the ovulation cycles and stuff, have just come to you through independent research. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing that, that uh, the gap I'm not I'm not bridging, the thing I'm not mm -hmm. getting, is uh, the there's a there's an undercurrent of like uh, you know the feminine has 
uh, you know, said everybody should be, you know, everybody should be a female. Um, mm-hmm. And then the, the red pill has come back and saying, no, everybody should be masked. Men should be masculine, women should be feminine. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas, uh, I personally, my my feeling is something like, um, stop with the shoulds. Let people do what they want, and nature will take over. Mm-hmm. Uh, which my understanding is that might be what you would call something like a purple pill. Um, so my question is, you know, uh, what am I, you know, there's obviously there's there's something that you think, or there's something you mm-hmm. know that I'm not getting. And so what would you say to me to, to get me there? Well, I think that what the I question mean, is about the purple pill essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would it take to get something from the purple pill? To the red pill. Oh, to the red pill side of things. Other I, than cluster B disorder. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, I think that when we're when we're talking about uh, the purple pill, and what I what I mean by the purple pill is guys who have sort of unplugged themselves from their blue pill conditioning, and they've that they've come into an awakening, and they really understand uh, how intersexual dynamics works in a real in in real time, but they still were not able to. Uh, really release some of their investments into blue pill idealism and all these you know nice Disney stories that um, that they grew up with and pedestalizing womankind uh, they still want to be able to take that red pill knowledge and they want to kind of force fit their old blue pill idealisms into that red pill knowledge so they'll say yeah those red pill guys uh, yeah, they, they really got it going right but uh, women are all that bad or not all women are like that or we're gonna just make each each person is an individual case, and I can tell you right now, from what I know of the the scientific side of what I espouse as far as the red pill is concerned, that there are patterns and specific um, specific ways and specific schedules. That's one of the reasons I wrote the second book. Is there are specific schedules that are predictable? Now, is it going to be right on spot for each woman contextually? Um, no, probably not. But it's going to be so so predictable that you will be able to say, yeah, okay, she's in her epiphany phase. Okay, she's in her alpha phase. She's in her party years. It's, it's real easy to see um, the, the prioritizations. Now, how they go about doing that, or maybe they don't do it at all, but they, they wait till they get you know, later on in life, and then they decide, oh, I miss, I, I'm making up for missing out, and they want to go back to that. They, they might actually retroactively go and do, you know, follow the schedule again. Uh, but I think that when you, if you, let's say if you are a purple pill guy, I think it's really important to reacquaint yourself with the, the true nature of, of men and women. And just, you know, <laughs> I can't disabuse you of your blue pill beliefs. I think that most, uh, most purple pill guys get to a point where they, they're, they're comfortable with it until they're not comfortable with it. And then they don't want to look across what I call the abyss. They don't want to go and say, oh, if I give up hope, if I give up my entire, uh, my, my entire I- idealistic dreams that I used to have, I want to have a, a wife and two kids and a, a white picket fence and a dog, and I want all this great stuff that Disney convinced me of. Oh, but we're all going to play equal because we all believe in egalitarian equalism at the same time. Uh, how can I make that fit with what I know is contradictory to, to that. And I think that staring across that abyss, you're trying to tell somebody that they need to recreate themselves. At the same time, you're also telling them, you've been living your life wrong. Or it's like saying you raised your kids wrong. And that's really hard, especially for our egos right now. It's like saying, I believed in all this shit for as long as I have, and now I'm 30 years old and I'm finding out that this is all, all horseshit. And like, Every, every one of you guys who has come and talked to me and shook my hand today has had a very similar story. Why is that? Because it's predictable. Um, you know, Alan here was just talking about, you know, telling me last night about how, um, how his wife was, uh, you know, asking for a divorce and wanted to kick him out of the house. And then I've got like two other guys telling me very similar stories to that. And then he says, and then I read your book and then I read through it and I, I, I I adopted what you were what you were saying in that, and sure enough, you know she now she's you know bringing you a couple of beers you know to to make up with you, and everything that I said would happen happened, and it's not because I have some like you know you know prophetic I, idea that that's going to happen. It's because I talk to everybody and I see how it goes through, and every one of you has a similar story of some kind, so it's the predictability factor of it. 
Um, that's, that's, I think, is the strongest thing I can say for purple pill guys who think it's not, it's always on a by case basis. It's all individual. It's all, all about, you know, people are people, you know. Nobody's all the same. No, well, yeah, okay. As individuals and as, like, as human beings, we all like to think that we're, we're unique. And so to say, yeah, we're unique, but we all, all follow kind of a pattern, they don't, people don't like that. They don't like that because it implies predestination. And, or, and especially when it comes to evolutionary psychology or biological or evo bio or evo psych, people don't like that because it conflicts with what they think about their own control of their own lives and people being responsible, having personal responsibility for their own actions. So it doesn't excuse you from that. Knowing what you know about the red pill does not excuse you from saying, okay, well, I know everything I know about the red pill. Women are hypergamous, so I'm just going to go and, and fuck as many bitches as I can, and we're all going to die because that's the, you know, that's the predestination of it. No, that's not. It doesn't excuse you from being a dickhead about it in the same, in the same way. So, I think we had a question in the back, and then maybe Max, too. Okay. Let's, uh, someone back there. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So my background, I've, I've lived half my life in Australia, half my life in Central Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, very different cultures. Australia, very utilitarian, much like the US. Central Europe, from my experience, uh, much more of a differentiation in that women are much more feminine, mm -hmm. uh, men are more masculine, and women expect their men to be masculine as well. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, hypergamy exists as well. So maybe the party is, and they want also security in their but they absolutely want to also um, have a masculine role model, and they don't necessarily fight against it. They'll fight against it if you're going to give it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the extreme, you go to in Russia, I was reading last year, where basically the Russian uh, government passed a law where you can actually even uh, have domestic abuse to keep your woman in line. Yeah, what's here? Exactly. Where there's a clear. Uh, demonstration of roles. Mm -hmm. So my question here a little bit is, um, are you looking mainly role for you lens from the US where you've had experience or do you yourself mm -hmm. take into consideration that this might vary between mm -hmm. cultures because somebody like Roosh mm -hmm. has make, makes a very clear differentiation that what he sees in the US mm -hmm. and what he experienced for example in Poland, right. very different examples. So we're talking about uh, cross-cultural uh, differences. differences between so Central Europe versus mm -hmm. Australia versus the United States. Mm -hmm. The differences of feminism, its effects there, and the feminine imperative. Right. Um, I, I, I can't help but have a Western American outlook on things because this is my culture and this is where I'm, where I'm from and this is what I see. However, on the second side of things, uh, I also, like I, we were saying just before, I aggregate as much information from as many guys as I possibly can. If you look around in this room, we all come from different cultures. We all come from different backgrounds. Alan comes from a Latin culture. Uh, I met a guy, I can't remember his name, sorry. He was from Peru, telling me exactly the same thing about how women are different there. Um, I, I was talking to Andy from, I believe he's Indian, you know, telling me about what his situation was. And he comes from a different culture, but yet he still followed that same blue pill path. He still was, you know, very, uh, despondent about a girl that he had one itis for, read my book, and then uh, turned his life around. So there's a guy from another culture right there. Uh, I, I do kind of one-on-one um, -on -one counseling with guys uh, who either hit me up on Twitter or they hit me up in a private email or they'll ask me, you know, specific questions. And I will tell you this, that from across cultures, whether it's, you know, from, from India to Africa to uh, South America, the patterns still say, stay the same. The guys are still looking for the same answers. And I really think that you can, take, uh, you can take men and women from different cultures and you can still apply standardized beauty, uh, beauty standards to, uh, to each one of them. We all want symmetrical faces. When we were talking about hypergamy, that is based on um, the research, uh, like cross-cultural research, cross uh, you know, countries, and you're deciding what are the, the key elements of a ma masculinized features and feminized features. So yeah, I get what you're saying. Uh, I also should say this as well as in the more egalitarian countries where um, like say Sweden or Norway where we have, uh, or Denmark I think, uh, they've done studies right now with the most, what they consider the most egalitarian countries and they still find in those countries that the, uh, the preference 
for um, traditional, conventional gender roles is even stronger in those countries than it is in, say, the United States or in ones where we think we have a patriarchy. Um, so underneath all that, underneath all of the social engineering is still our base biologies and it's still how we have evolved as humankinds and how we have evolved as um, you know, men and women together. So basically the more they lack it, the more they crave it. Exactly. And so that is universal. We're all human beings and we all came from a, a, a similar root. We all came from hunter-gatherer, forager um, uh, beginnings. And you have to understand, I think, I forget who was telling me this, but we, I, it was yesterday's speech was saying that in, in the span of time, monogamy, human monogamy is just like a, a tiny little, you know, speck on the human evolution scale. And it's a really new, um, a new invention really by humankind. And we think of it as normal because we've been doing it since, you know, since the days of, you know, Abraham where, you know, we had polygamy back then and then we switched over into a, uh, into a mono more monogamous, you know, social interaction between men and women. Uh, I can talk your ear off about that, but um, I think that we, we don't really understand that even in spite of ourselves and in spite of how we would like to have these perfect little marriages and perfect, uh, you know, long-term long relationships and monogamy, we are just now still testing that. It's just a blink of an eye in the, in the evolutionary history of it. Cool. Uh, let's get into some of these. Let's see. All right. Oh, we got someone in the back there, actually. Oh, let's get to, oh, Tanner. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah, the Mormon. <laughs> Mm -hmm. How do we make it appealing before having to get run through the ringer and be mm -hmm. able to recruit it in a way that's positive and proactive mm -hmm. as opposed to reactive? Mm -hmm. So the question is how to promote positive masculinity in a before proactive way happens. rather than a reactive, yeah. you know, you just got burned in divorce court or something. All right. Well, I, I'll, I will reveal an ulterior motive here for you. One of the reasons I wanted to have Hunter here and I wanted to have Ryan here and to sort of... Uh, present a, a broader spectrum of what I think the red pill is and has the potential to be is I really think that this understanding and this awareness, I mean, the first thing you can do is become red pill aware yourself and to pass that on and to talk to other guys about it. And it's very hard, I understand, to talk to a blue pill guy who's very, very resistant to it. That's one way to go about it. Uh, I always I always say, you know, uh, I, I promote the, the physical uh, print copy of my books because I really want guys to take that, hand it to their friend and say, um, you know, here, this really helped me out. Why don't you check it out? Um, I mean, the fact that a, a therapist guy was handing out my book as part of his therapy, you know, is, that's encouraging. I'll say that. Uh, I've personally used Amazon as my rational male conveyor belt yeah. throughout, the, throughout the world <laughs> this past year. Well, but to get to, get to Tanner's point, um, I really think that it's very imperative if you are a father or if you have aspirations to be a father, that you need to do so from the perspective of being red pill aware and teaching your kids from a positive masculine uh, set up. Uh, in the, really the whole reason I wrote Positive Masculinity, the, at least the first quarter of that book, is dedicated to the red pill parent. And I really think that it's vitally important in this day and age that if you have kids or if you plan to have kids, and a lot of guys hit me up and say, I don't know, my, I don't want my poor kid to get you know, wrapped up by the village and taught by the village. Uh, you know, you can say, oh, you can take them out of school and homeschool them, but I'll tell you right now that if you go and you do something like that, you can't insulate your kids entirely. There's going to be social media. There's going to be, you know, whatever song that they go around, you know, singing. Uh, they're, they're going to be affected by that in some way. And what you as a guy, as a father, needs to do is be that filter and be that buffer and be the... Um, the, the filter through which that information comes. And there's easy ways to do that and there's more complex ways to do that. And they get more complex when you've got teenagers as opposed to when they're, they're young kids. Um, say for instance, we're talking about little, little Johnny who is being taught by his nothing but female teachers. Well, you can simply say things as, as, as simple as, hey Johnny, isn't it really funny that uh, all of your teachers are, are women? And just like make them aware of that. Oh, they are, you know, because you're not thinking about that. They're just running around being kids. You know, they don't have a, a, a capacity for abstract thought at that point. So when you relate to them as kids, you kind of insert that message kind of tactfully into, you know, like say you're watching TV or you're watching um, the latest Disney princess movie and the, and the princess saves the, saves the prince this time. And that's pretty much the theme of every damn Disney movie where it's like, it's, it's what I call the fempowerment narrative 
where the woman is completely self-sufficient and she's got to be the unique cure for the poor hapless sucker. And we've gone from, from dad being a chump to the prince being a chump that needs her unique skills and her unique talents to solve his problems in spite of himself, to save him from himself. Such as tying his shoes. Exactly. So you've got those things going on and that's the narrative that the kid's getting. And they don't know that they're getting a narrative because again, like I said, they don't have the capacity for abstract thought at that point. So you need to step in at that point and you need to say, isn't it silly that the princess would, would try to save the prince? You know, the prince, the prince has got it going on. He could be better than that. Or you, you, know, you filter in the material that your, your kid is going to, going to view. Those are real simplistic ways to do it. There's, there's, like I said, there's more complex ways to do it, and I get into that in the, in the, I have a list of about 32 ways that you can go about uh, you know, red pill parenting. One thing I want to add on this too, in terms of promoting positive masculinity, is media. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I'm trying to spearhead that in terms of, no oh shit, in terms of, uh, I forget this sometimes, in terms of video, mm -hmm. video production, which is sorely lacking in the red pill. Um, in a way, and I wanted to mention this yesterday, but I'll mention it now, I've been building this conference for technically over 11 years now. And in a large way, I've, I've interacted with many different communities from health and fitness, philosophy, and so on. I feel like I've been building this convention for something like the Red Pill that I wasn't aware of only lightly in recent years. And then last year, I found Rollo on the Red Pill. So I'm really inspired and happy that I could have built this thing, not exactly knowing what it was going to be used for in this specific sense and what I, mm -hmm. in a way, what it was founded as. This company started from the pickup community and in dealing with male-female relationships. So I'm very happy that I could do that, and that I think, I think media is the future in terms of empowering this community and growing it uh, above and beyond just blogs and a few audio podcasts. And that's also why it's very sad when Mark Baxter decided to close his podcast. Right. You right. guys are desperate for media, and I can do a lot, but I can't do everything. So the more good podcasts you guys can start, the more video blogs, the more channels, the better. Yeah. On top of written blogs, on top of Twitter accounts yeah. and all that. And don't think that you don't have something to contribute. You probably do. As long as you have some red pill awareness to what it is that you're, uh, you know, however you're applying, whatever you're doing in your life. Like, for instance, I'm sure that probably uh, uh, Hunter didn't realize that he could actually, you know, start a blog and do what he was going to do. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of guys who just say, I'm not going to do it because who wants to hear? I'm just repeating the same thing. Well, you know, give it a shot. See, you know, sp spread that out. On the back. Richard Cooper. Um, Rich. Right. Yep. Okay. So the question is about uh, red pill rage. When, uh, say, a blue pill person hears about the red pill for the first time and gets really angry or flustered somehow. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the single most common criticism of the red pill right now is they, uh, the, the critics, particularly purple pill critics, they like to, they like to present the fact that, or that red pill guys are angry. They, they just, they, they learn about red pill awareness and they turn that to rage and they think that the anger is rooted in the feminine. They think that it's rooted in an anger or uh, a hatred of women. And I'm constantly having to defend against that because anger is part of the process of unplugging. And if you go on to the, uh, the, the, the red pill Reddit, uh, everybody says, oh, those guys are just, they're just anger filled bitter guys and and they use that as sort of their marketing tool to say we're not like that come over here to you know my life coaching you know business uh, I will tell you right now yes you will get angry that's just part of it I have a, a post called the uh, the five stages of unplugging it's actually six stages but five stages of unplugging and they all mirror the five stages of grief because you've got uh, denial you've got um, anger, anger You've got acceptance. Uh, I, I'm not going to run through all of them, but it basically follows the, uh, the cycle of grief. And the reason it does that is because you are killing your old self. You have just, you're, you're mourning the death of your blue pill self. When, when you get angry and when you are going through those phases, we say they're, you know, he's caught in the anger phase or he's in the acceptance phase now. Um, sometimes there's a sixth phase, which is sort of like the remorse phase. Um, but I think that if you're going to unplug healthily, there's going to be an anger part of it. And how, first of all, you gotta, you gotta remember, where does that anger come from? That anger comes from, not from hatred of women. It's not from, bitches did this to me and I'm, I'm bitter and I can't get a girlfriend, so uh, I'm gonna rage on, 
on Twitter, I'm going to go on my you know, keyboard and pound the keyboard for a little bit. Um, I think that that might, be, that might be the response of some people, but it's certainly not the most common response. And well, the enemies of the red pillar is cherry picking. Well, yeah, they are, because it, it serves their end. It serves their purpose to, to do so, to drive people away from becoming red pill aware. Because like I was saying just a minute ago, you have to stare across the abyss. And you have to find some way to rebuild yourself and recreate yourself in a red pill paradigm, cut away from that blue pill idealism that you just had. And so f from that respect, uh, you're, you're mourning the loss of your, your old blue pill life, and you don't know what to do with yourself. But more so, that r anger is really rooted in anger at oneself, because for so long, you have been in this sort of blue pill days and this blue pill delusion. And what happens is you, there is anger, but the anger is not at women. The anger is at oneself. It's like, damn, why didn't I see this? Damn, this is so obvious. Uh, you know, thank you, Roll. Thank you for saving my life. I was going about, about to kill myself, but now I'm just angry that I didn't see all this stuff happening before, so I even got to that point. Imagine you are so despondent that you are in your blue pill beliefs and you're breaking up with your girlfriend and you're ready to put the noose around your neck, and then suddenly somebody says, here's, here's the red pill and here's how to be red pill aware. And uh, these are the, this is why your wife or your girlfriend is leaving you and what, what, what you did and what she did, how she responded. And you go through all that and you realize that the game has been played on you to the point that you've got a noose around your neck. That's pretty fucking significant. <laughs> and so um, I think that that anger is really anger that, of not seeing it before it actually happened. So how do you fight against that? You, you make guys aware of that. You say, you know, you're, you're going to be angry, but there's, there's hope after that. I have a, a post called uh, New Hope. And I think that guys really get stuck in the idea that there's no hope. And it's, it's completely nihilistic. And, and uh, you know, we're never going to be able to, to have all those great things that they told us we were going to have when I was in my blue, pill, uh, my blue pill phase. Now that I'm red pill, it's all on me. I got no excuse. I know, all, I know what I need to know now. Um, I have to rebuild my life. Uh, maybe you're rebuilding that you know, literally with a, a new woman or you're, you're you know, being kicked out of your house and you've got to basically restart your life. And that might really suck, especially if you became awakened when you're like 40 or 50 years old. And you go, fuck, I got to go and uh, re restart my, my life again and I'm 50 years old. It took me this long to get to this point where I thought things were going to be working out. And you realize that you have such a life investment up to that point where you woke up yeah, you're going to be angry, and you're going to be angry at yourself because you didn't figure well, it out. This is like the Matrix analogy. You don't wake a person up after a certain age, yeah. or it becomes increasingly risky to do so. Right, right. That's why Neo bends over on the floor and hacks up his guts right there, because it's just such an overwhelming, you know, oh my god, I can't go back to that. But given all that, I think a basic way of what you're saying is that anger is pretty normal. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely a normal phase, and I think that that also needs to be something that uh, whenever a red pill critic says those guys are just you know angry all the time it's like no they're not angry all the time they're angry as part of a phase before they can move into something that's a little bit more productive for themselves yeah you're gonna get angry sorry we have time for a few more sure uh, one or two more we might as well <laughs> yep, let's get Max you know I was gonna say <laughs> I didn't have to write anything. You guys are asking me everything I would have wrote down on this. Um, as far as tribes are concerned, in the- uh, The question is oh, basically, questions about men organizing into tribes, mm -hmm. essentially. Okay, I have a, it's a, I think it's probably one of my seminal posts on, on the Rational Mail called Tribes. And it's also featured as a, uh, a chapter in my book, in the third book. And right now, right here, you are already part of, part of a tribe. Men are intrinsically tribal in nature, okay? We want to come together, we want to, you know, we ha we, I mean, in our evolutionary past, we kind of had to. We didn't have really much choice because if we we're gonna bring down a giant woolly mammoth or an antelope or something like that, you had to have four dudes to help you do it because you couldn't do it by yourself. And you had to be able to rely on those dudes to help you make that kill because if you didn't make that kill, you weren't gonna eat that day. And you know who else wasn't gonna eat? Your kid and your wife they, or your girl or whatever it was. Um, they're not going to be able to eat either. So you've got to come together and you have to collectivize and have a particular goal in mind. And that's, I was telling some of the guys here that if, you, um, if you're going to get together, uh, if you're going to collectively grab guys together, I think we have some, like Don here was trying to get a group of guys together in the Phoenix area and just get them together and we're going to make a, a rational male satellite group or something like that over here. 
the first thing I told them, I said, you need to base that around something that all the guys can do together. They have to sit down, and if they're into you know, going to the shooting range, or if they're into fishing, or if they're into some particular activity, that's how men relate to each other. We have to have some purpose for us to get together and, and, and talk. So it's not like, like I, I have this other post called, Women Talk, Men Do. And so when men are at the, the bar and they're sitting there and they're watching the game, this is how they, this is how they, they, they relate. They go, hey, you know, what do you think? You know, and they're looking out this way and they're talking this way, whereas when women are talking, they're talking this way. And it's always a face-to-face -face kind of thing because there is always the, the difference between the communication styles of men and women is that women prioritize the context of the information, how the relating makes them feel, whereas men only care about the content, the information. And that goes back again to the tribal thing. How that's, do, we, how do a, we kill a woolly mammoth? That's this entire conference, too. Yeah, really. Focus on content. Yeah, we're, we're ba we all have a collective interest to be here and to do this. So. Um, like I said, it goes back to the evolutionary side of things where we also have, some, have to have something to do and have to have a purpose. So when you're relating to your kid, to your boy, have something to do with him. Go and say, we're going to go fix the car, Johnny. Let's go fix the car. And then you're going to talk some stuff. Or like, if you have a father who you're trying to sort of reconnect with, you say, hey, dad, why don't we go fly fishing this weekend? Or why don't we go do something? Because you're going to be, you have a purpose and you have a goal to complete. And in, this, in the process of completing that goal, that's when you're going to really talk to each other and you're really going to relate. Also, this goes back to, uh, once again, the, the village trying to emasculate men. They want you to believe that the only correct freaking way to talk to another man is to look at them like this and relate as if, women, as if we are women. They want, they, seriously, they want to put you together and they want you, they, like, I'm sure you've probably heard this, two, two wives have two husbands and they don't know each other. And it's like they get them together for a play date so they can all, you know, that we can all inter interrelate and we can all go and have a double, it's a double date, but they want the, the guys to get along as if they are children. And how do they do that? They expect those men to relate to each other as women would. And when in reality, we need something to do. We need, we need a project to, well, it's to build. Well, also solipsism at work, right? For them. That too, because we're also dealing with women's innate solipsism and not thinking about anything really outside of themselves. It's not malicious, it's just, yeah. that's just how they It's think. just the easiest way to, to pass off the, the, the responsibility, the obligation of you know, having to get these guys together so that we can get together. Yep. Uh, we got to wrap up. Uh, Rolla, thank you so much. Okay. For those of you who still have questions, uh, hang on, hang on. You know, we got to wrap up. All the questions over for now, except for the next, like, three days he's here. Yeah. You can talk to him yeah, again and, and again yeah. and again. Also, also going to say just a quick pitch here yeah. is that I really think that this convention, especially now that we've sort of turned the corner here and it's become a more red pill bit of a hard, Bit of a hard red turn. Yeah, exactly. Um, I really think that there's so much more to this convention than just me getting up on stage or the guys getting up on here for an hour and talking about it. The real value of this convention is being able to talk to guys outside of it and go off to, you know, we're gonna, like, I know Christian and, and Goldman went off to go clubbing or whatever, they probably would be happy to take you along with them, you know, yeah. or they're, you know, we've got um, so many guys here from so many different branches of, of life. And I think that, you know, just being able to, you know, you can have access to me, great, but I mean, there's also a lot of guys here who have other experiences and they're connecting their own dots. So it's not just, you know, oh, we're going to go listen to a bunch of speakers. No, there's so much more going on around here. Yep. So. Thank you, Rolo. Appreciate it. Thank you.